I've been doing conventions for 20 years. I have been able at all times to be able to say, please welcome to the stage the legend, Mr. William Shatner.
Run me red. That's exactly right. <laughs> so I don't know what I've got, but it's becoming irritating. And finally I asked somebody and they said, oh, maybe you have tinnitus. Uh, I didn't even know how to pronounce it. Tinnitus? No. American is tinnitus. But I'm from Canada. Oh, maybe you do say tinnitus. Actually, both pronunciations are correct. I discover I have tinnitus. Tinnitus. And it's driving me nuts. In fact, to drop the head for a moment, I became a spokesperson for tinnitus. And famous people would call me, famous musicians. And about six months ago, a famous actor called and said, I, I, I can't burn my life, I got this. Shh. <laughs> and I had to, I had to talk him down because it's, it's almost suicidal. So I went all over the United States trying to get rid of and could ended up at the hospital here where there was, now I can't remember what I had for breakfast. I don't think I ate breakfast. But I remember this doctor's name, Dr. Jostrakov, working at the John Hopkins, whose focus was tinnitus. And when I finally got, found him through a bizarre search, Dr. Johnson, I said, do you know what I'm talking about when I said that? He says, no, I have tinnitus. I said, but what, do you hear it all the time? He says, I hear it every time I talk about it. I said, but that's your job for 12 hours a day. That's right, I'm hearing it all the time. <laughs> so tinnitus takes, the, takes different forms. Mine is, my daughter had an infection in her ear, and she began to hear the national anthem. <laughs> Bizarre. Anyway, so I ended up at St. Uh, John Hopkins for many days in which he uh, examined me. And the overriding thing about tinnitus is it's inside your head. It's a, they're finding out more and more what it is, and I'm not sure what the latest uh, observation is, but it's in your brain, not your hearing, is the word. Uh, so there are things they, they're learning to do about the brain. As I'm sure you know, the brain is being examined uh, every day by so many people. They're mapping out areas that where our behavior is and <clears throat> becoming more and more um, exotic, precise. So one of these days they'll, they'll have a, a cure for it. What, what I'm anticipating happening is I'm lying there like I'm dying. I, I, I'm dying. I think this is my last breath. And as I say that, somebody runs and they've got the cure for tinnitus. <laughs> and I leave this earth hearing <laughs> All right, now if you ask me a question concerning shh, you're out. <laughs> hey, you, Mr. Shatner. My name is Rich. Uh, Fritz? Fritch. Oh, Rich. Fritch. Oh, Fritz. That's the tinnitus, right. <laughs> I was sure you said Fritz. <laughs> uh, my question was about judgment at Nuremberg, and I was wondering uh, if you could tell us any stories about that and working with Stanley Kramer. Wow. On this episode, you answer? Yeah, that's a long time ago. Where are you going, Fritz? <laughs> no, 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 sit down. Is that what you said? <laughs> Judgment at Nuremberg was a film I did really early on. Uh, I had been working in New York City on Broadway and live television. Any of you here ever seen live television? Hand up. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, two of you. <laughs> well, there was an era in television before, um, <laughs> this is Monster Mania. I wonder what's underneath there. <laughs> there was a period of time in television which was 
new technology where these large cameras would film, would, uh, not film, would, would portray, would, would have the image sports and things like that, which was live. And then we would do dramas, which were like plays. And these big cameras would move around and you were seeing the play live. There was no recording of it or anything. So the actors were uh, standing on marks. If they had to hit a mark, they would have to walk to the mark because it was lit there and the cameras were ready there. So not only did you have to remember your words and what you were doing and being a performer, but you had to hit those marks. So a lot of actors couldn't do all that and still not go as a camera would instead of lensing into a close-up, these giant cameras would have to come come right close to you as a close-up. So here is this giant thing coming right at you. And not only that, go close to the microphone and go, <laughs> that's the sound the cameras would make. Because they had hot uh, um, things in them and a fan that would dissipate the heat. They had hot bulbs in them. They were giant, they were as big as this table. And would come into a close-up. So you could imagine an actor who is not accustomed to it, is about to say, I love you. And he goes to go, I whoa! That happened a lot. So actors who had had a lot of experience were in demand. And I had come from Canada and I'd done a, a play in, uh, in uh, I'd been in Stratford, Ontario. We brought a play down to New York and I got successful so they began to re ask for me in these live television shows. What am I talking about? <laughs> I believe Nuremberg? Right, so what has this got to do with Nuremberg? I'm not sure. He has to put Fritz. I know. So let's ask him. Well, this is what All right. This is what that has to do with. So I became well known in live television. I was doing more live television because I wouldn't go, oh my God, what's that? Uh, very often. So I was in demand. And, and people in Hollywood saw these live television shows and saw this young actor and called me to Hollywood to be in Judgment of Nuremberg. So, I don't remember whether that was my first film, but it was among the first films. So I come to Hollywood to be in Judgment of Nuremberg. And I, I had started in Canada, and I remember thinking, if I could just make a hundred dollars a week, I could, I could, I could live on a hundred dollars a week. I could, I could probably, you know, I didn't want to have children because that was a responsibility. But I could, I could live on a hundred dollars a week. So now they call me to Hollywood and they say we're going to pay you thousands of dollars a week. I'm like, God, I'm kidding. It's the end of the world. Of course, they weren't paying me anything compared to what they were paying these other actors. But so they said we've got this movie about Nuremberg. Now I'm Jewish and I know about what Nuremberg, the town of Nuremberg contained. There was a trial that went on in the town of Nuremberg in Germany in which the, the Nazi officers of that regime were on trial. And it was famous for the fact that Americans used liberty and justice to, to uh, see what these monsters had done and convicted uh, a large number of them and went off to jail. It was a famous time in which American justice applied to the uh, Nazi overlords and we felt, America felt, that justice had been served. So now this was a movie of those and, you know, there, there are no terms to characterize how awful these people were. 
So I got the job of a, of a lawyer, a, a military lawyer, at the table where all these characters would be judged. And these Nazi characters were now being played by American, well-known American actors. So I sat at a table like this for weeks on end at a parade of famous actors that I had seen being born in Montreal. I had seen and seen on the, the Silver Street. What was that? God bless you, Jerry. I'm going to say screen again. I want you to sneeze. Screen. Chew. That's right out of a cliche. You ask the actor to sneeze, you have to chew. Oh, man, that's not how we sneeze. Sneeze. You're higher. So, I got to see Judy Garland. I got to see, oh, I can't even remember the names of these people on the screen. What was the name of the guy, the actor, Burt Lancaster? So, one, for example, Burt Lancaster played a Nazi guy. So, here comes Burt Lancaster. I'd seen Burt Lancaster on film all my life. And I'm looking at Burt Lancaster, and he's in the dock, and he's going to make a speech. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if you remember. Is that who had hands up who, who know who Burt Lancaster is? Okay, good. So, Burt Lancaster had that thing, didn't he? He had that grin. And I'm gonna, I'm in the circus. I'm gonna kill you. I, and he's got this look. So, we're gonna see how he's playing this Nazi guy. Did you know how he played the Nazi guy? He played the Nazi guy. Like that. Okay? So, he's the Nazi guy. He plays a guy. Yeah, I kill him all. I kill the other guy. And he leaves. Bert Lancaster's in for a day. Wow, Ooh, there goes Bert Lancaster. Next day, Bert Lancaster comes back. He didn't like what he had done, and he wanted to do it again. I said, okay, Bert, you just said, we got the time, good. All right, action, Bert. And Bert goes, and then <laughs> That's exactly what he did the day before, but now he's happy. So things like that happened all the time. Spencer Tracy, do we know Spencer Tracy? So Spencer you know that only a few hands went up? And, no, but I mean, most of you don't know who Spencer Tracy is, which is my thought about how ephemeral fame is for act for anybody. Famous doctors, famous actors, they're, you know, a year. I give you a year, two years. I give you five years, and you don't know what I'm talking about. So, Spencer Tracy was a big actor then, an older man, and he had this long speech, and I admired him so much. And I'm sitting at the table, and I'm watching him make this long, long speech. He was the judge. And he makes this long speech, page after page. And I'm this, and I'm going to go down, and I'm going to get, and I'm some good. And he goes on for 15 minutes, the end of which everybody applauds, including me. I had the occasion to come up to him shortly afterwards. And I just, I've been on live television, but I came from the stage, I was on Broadway, I was in Canada doing great classical theater, I'll put the theater. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Crazy, that was really wonderful. I didn't know film actors remembered lines. And he looked at me. And he never spoke to me again. <laughs> Judgment of her. Mr. Shatner, how are you today? I've got so question. many crabs last <laughs> night. I'm telling you, I've got water retention. I don't look like this ordinarily, only when I eat a lot of crabs. I mean, your crab glow is excellent. Yeah. But crab glow is what? Excellent. How do you rate that? What, what is your, what's your maximum number of crabs? Uh, zero. I'm not a fan of seafood. What? Uh, you don't eat crabs? I do not. I agree. That is a reaction. Well, maybe he knows something we don't know. Why don't you eat crabs? I've just never been a fan of seafood. Don't like the texture. Don't like, I don't like sea bugs. Like, that's not so my what thing. do you eat? Uh, 
a lot. <laughs> is that boiled or fried? I'll take it either one. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I'm Jeff, and we spoke briefly last night. Uh, I remember every word, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Again. Uh, quick question. I know uh, you played Captain Kirk and everything, but you've been to actual space now. How was that? What was your experience like? Did you, was it mind blowing? Did you enjoy it? Like, how okay, is it? So, so, I've got a limited time here. <laughs> no, no, I mean it's true, because I've got several answers. Like, ask me, how was it? How was it? Empty. <laughs> okay? So that's one answer. There's another answer, like, three minutes. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm answering it. And then I went, like, or there is an answer in which I was profoundly affected by what, what happened to me. And that's a, a, a fairly long story, which in its entirety, uh, I would love to tell you, but I don't know, uh, you know, it, it will, the gentleman behind you, what's your name? Ray. You know, Ray, is it Greg? Ray. 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 Might not have time for Ray to ask his question. <laughs> in fact, Ray, ask your question in front of the... Uh, what what is the que your question, Ray? Right? Oh, I had a question, but um, I noticed over the years I enjoyed. No, no, don't go away. No, no. I, I'm 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 trying to. We'll do it. I'm trying to make Ray feel good when he doesn't get to ask his question. <laughs> I noticed over the years watching it work. You, there's a lot of emphasis in voice and you know movement and gesture. Not just uh, you're talking about me. Yes. A lot of voice and gesture. Well, you, you can see, you know, the sounds off, you get the impression of what you're putting in box. Yes. And, uh, it's I called wonder, acting. I wonder if, <laughs> I wonder if it had a lot to do with it. You mentioned the stage and all, and I wonder if there's a Shakespearean element. It seemed like a lot of Shakespearean gotcha. actors do. Go ahead, take a step back, and we're going to do that. <laughs> I got it. Okay. So, space. Yes. <laughs> The fun is right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I entertained at Kennedy Center a while ago, and uh, and and uh, I'm trying to find the right place to start the story. I wrote a book. Uh, a, a, most recent book called Boldigo, in which I, which is that, I got, you should have bought 15. <laughs> One miserable book in your hand. In which I think the premise is that the universe is looking after me. So many terrible things happen, and then it turns out to be good, or something else evolves. I think that, you know, if you have the time, that means your lifetime, to watch it all go by, it's cyclical. So, I, oh, God, it's terrible. It's death. Oh, no, it's life. Look at that. Oh, no, it's not good. Oh, yes, it is. And, it, and it's, it's cyclical. Now, part of my psychology is this. Every time I talk about, I don't know, he's that age. He should know something about life. I know nothing. <laughs> it's terrible. I don't know anything. I walk around thinking, I don't know anything. You know, what do you think about, you know, the situation in Egypt? Where is Egypt? <laughs> <laughs> you know what floaters are? I just had a floater. <laughs> That's um, so the book, I think, and about. I believe about 85% of what I'm saying, the other 15% is bullshit. Okay. <laughs> but even then, I don't know when I'm bullshitting and when I'm... Uh, 
So I think the universe is really looking after me. Things happen like that is the weirdest coincidence. And yet, you know, there's a group of thinking where there's no such thing as coincidence. It was meant to happen. And to give you a shorthand, there is a scientific theory of entanglement, that everything is entangled. And I believe that everything is entangled, whether it's string theory or not. There's an entanglement. Everything seems to work. I'm doing a children's album right now with the team that I wrote the songs for the entertainment in for the performance at Kennedy Center, which is now going to be an album uh, under the London Symphony Orchestra thing, and a documentary of the performance, and the the performance. All songs that I and uh, essentially another guy, Robert Chernow, and I wrote. So we had a number of songs that pertain to me, my son is my experience. We made it into music. So there's a, an album called Bill, which is out there right now, with the same with, with the songs that we had written. And we had all these other songs left over. I'm, I'm going to give you an insight to why I think the universe takes care of me. So we had all these songs that we had so enjoyed writing. We wrote the song. The first album I made so many years ago was The Transformed Man. And it wasn't, thank you. Oh, there was, it wasn't very successful. And I could go into that, but I won't because we've got to get to right and find out what I was doing as an actor. So I wrote, we wrote a number of songs. I get a call from the guy who found the transformed man in a garage sale. Ben Folds, do we know Ben Folds? <laughs> so Ben Folds, 20 years later, sees the album, plays the album, calls me, says, I'd like to work with you. And he writes me a song called White Oleander in an album of his called Fear of Pop. Fear of Pop becomes very popular, and White Oleander becomes the most popular song on the Fear of Pop. And now I'm back singing, so I make a number of albums. I, uh, uh, ben Bowles becomes a great acquaintance of mine, but we lose track of each other. So one day, not so long ago, he calls me, and Bill Ben, I'm now artistic director at Kennedy Center. Would you like to come and be on stage at the uh, opera house, sees 3,000 people, and perform for a night. I said, Ben, I've got the exact songs. And one of the songs that we wrote for going into space, you see how it's all coming around? <laughs> is called So Fragile, So Blue. And it's all about that experience I had going up and looking around and realizing all the things on Earth that are going extinct. I was over, because I've been an ecologist since I read Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring, 60 years ago. She was forecasting what's happening now. And I've been talking about this. The world is coming to an end, don't you understand? We've got to do something, you know? And, and because it's like we're behind in the rent, let's go to a movie. You don't want to think about it. People of the world don't want to think about it. what's coming our way. What's here ain't going to get worse. So, this song, So Fragile, So Blue, is about this experience I had. This, not the insight, but this alarm that went off in my head when I saw the world over there and I saw the blackness of space there. And we wrote a song. All that it says, you know, it's terrible, and then all the beautiful things, as many as we can think of, of all the beautiful things that are going extinct. I drove from Los Angeles to San Francisco and back in 24 hours. I had to do something, I wanted to get back home. So I went 700 miles or so in the 
in the um, Fertile Valley, the, uh, what's that valley? San Fernando? No, no, that's where I live. The, <laughs> no, the San Joaquin, San Joaquin Valley. The most fertile, one of the most fertile places on earth. Everything, it's the bread basket of America. Everything grows there, or did. But we mishandled it so much so that it's, it's uh, getting less so. Ten years ago, when I would make that journey, you'd have to stop every hundred miles or so and scrape the insects off the windshield. Wind One splat in 700 miles. Here's the sadness for me. What made me, I didn't realize it until I was able, even days later, to think about it. And I'll give you my observations rather than going into them. I didn't think of it until days later. Things are going extinct by the tens of thousands. And the sad thing is, we, didn't, we, we don't know they existed. It took 3.8 billion years to evolve to whatever this beautiful, sacred piece of life was. And it's gone. And we didn't know it existed. The magic of life, the beauty, the awesome, the, the incredible mystery of life's uh, 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 spewed, sperm, um, slime. Slime is alive. Do you know a slime can work its way out of a maze and looks for the sun for light? Or these great trees that cling to cliffs? that are thousands of years old, just examples of how the imperative to life, I want to live everything, I want to live. You cut down a tree, the vines grow up. The mother tree takes care of the baby trees. Everything's in time, trying to live. And there are things that took billions of years to evolve the magic of it. And they're gone. And we didn't know they they were there. It's one thing to say the lions and the tigers are disappearing, but we knew that they were majestic animals. You should have seen them, Bobby. They were alive for 15 years ago. Now all the lions are gone, the hippos are gone, the giraffes are gone, the tigers are gone. You should have seen them, Bobby. They were wonderful. We can't even say that because we don't know they existed. That's the sadness that I felt when I came down. Two more observations. One is, I saw the circumference of the earth. I could make a circle. We live on a rock, okay, that in some places it, the rock is broken down to be earth and things grow, okay? We're a moat of dust in this incredible thing called the universe. We are negligible. We human beings are on this negligible rock. We're, we're virus on the rock. We're nothing. And then the third observation came to me. We're observers of this miracle. We're observers of life. We're observers, observers of the awe and mystery of space. The Webb Telescope. We we invented the Webb Telescope. Why? Why did we invent the Webb Telescope? For knowledge. To observe, to see this incredible thing called the universe. So we're not negligent. We're observers. We're we're the journalists of the magic of life. And that's the evolution of what I felt having come down from space. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now then. Yeah, <laughs> so you're saying. When you watched me, you saw 
you, you were convinced that I was doing, I meant what I said. It was influence. Yeah, that's right. A little yeah. rain. Yeah. <laughs> Very believable. And, and um, like, to go back to the Star Trek scenes, Captain Bob, it was like an aside on the stage. Speaking of the world, so that's the feeling that I have. Oh, let's tell you. I started, uh, I was in a cat play when I was six years old. You know, uh, I'm sure you can tell me the same thing. It was in Montreal, parents sent the kids up to the country for a couple of weeks. You know, and you see the stars for the first time because you're a city boy. That's what happened to me, and somehow there was a camp play being written. They gave me a part in it, and I had a speech, and I gave this speech, and uh, it was a meaningful speech. And then I could see, when I finished, I could see the audience was crying. I had made this audience of parents cry, and my father picked me up. My boy, Bill. My father's giving me love. I made people cry. I've never done anything else. Since I was six years old, I've been in front of an audience doing something. Uh, acting, writing, producing. You know, I love doing what we're doing here right now. It's a total spontaneous exercise between you and me. And for example, why did you, what made you observe that? What, what, what was, well, are, are, do you, have you ever wanted to be an actor? Have you been an actor? I've done some things as a child. So I went slowly, right into the mic. I did some things as a child. Um, what, what kind of musical? What kind of, what um, kind of? Well, it was a musical. It was a spoof on uh, South Pacific. And, and you performed that? Yeah, Jack Frost, by myself, solo, stand up. I've done a lot of things like that. And then um, before I retired. So, so you knew the problems and. Uh, uh, anxieties, right there. And use the power. The, yeah, and the power. The power. Yeah, there is an element of power that you're talking to about. Reason. That power is like, um, like a dictator's power. It could go south very quickly. Um, I I've always tried to think in terms of uh, history on our personal life. So if something terrible is happening to you, if you sort of give it a, a little artistic distance, like I know that in six months this is not going to be as important as this is now. So I was asked to do a one-man show on Broadway. And I had been touring in a kind of one man show, but when I was asked to do it, I rewrote everything. And now, and I hadn't performed it in front of an audience. So now it's opening night on Broadway. Critics are there, everybody's there, and I'm alone on stage, talking pretty much the way I'm talking to you. The night before, realizing how important this, this the tomorrow night will be, I was very careful about what I ate. No crabs. <laughs> so the next day, I was sick as a dog. I, I, things were pouring out of every orifice. Okay. I couldn't leave the toilet. In fact, Dr. Oz, whom I had met, we've become acquaintances, came over to try and take care of me. So I got to the theater, and I'm really, I, I, where's the toilet? Okay, the toilet's over there. And I go on stage. Now I'm alone on stage. And suddenly I have to go. Not only do I, I should have used the past, the present, the guy had to go. Mm. It's the past tense. <laughs> I went <laughs> on Broadway, opening night, and I'm alone on stage, and I realize I better get off stage. 
hands up for anyone who's crept in their pants. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I'm taking, I'm taking a, uh, a, 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 a examination. Half the audience just raised their hand. <laughs> and the other half probably went to go on a show because they're not sure show I went to crept in my pants. I've got a sphincter muscle that works. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I've got a sphincter too. But it doesn't work at times. Eh? So now I so, so I said, uh, there's been a technical uh, the, the thing uh, just went wrong. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll pause for a minute and I'll be right back. And I run to my dressing room and I shower. My wife somehow helps me. And we washed them, back, and I get back on stage and finished, uh, and got great notice of me and did a, a, a really very successful run. But that, the, the, my ability to stay in the moment and think of there's been a technical difficulty, I'll be right back, comes from all the years and years of experience. So probably what you're seeing is many, many hours of trying to entertain, be informative, and being amusing is what you was what you're seeing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Oh, please, don't get up.